for our message, the title that I gave Gord is Like a Good Neighbor, BBC is there. You're probably familiar with State Farm, right? You can't, can't have, if you watched any sports around TV, especially college sports in the US, State Farm are all over it. Um, now let me ask you a very personal question. How many of you are involved in some way, shape, or form with social media? Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. I mean, there are just so many different forms of social media these days. Now, I'm an old guy, so I'm a Facebook person. Occasionally, I'll look at Twitter because sports guys put stuff up on Twitter all the time too. But basically, us old folks, us grandparents, are Facebook people. Now, I'm not sure that that was the intention when it first started. I think it was college-age students, right? Mark Zuckerberg was a university student when they developed and started Facebook, and it was for their young people to communicate, but really it's grandparents who have taken over Facebook. And there's two good reasons for us being involved with Facebook. One is that it allows you to keep track of your grandchildren's lives. That is like one of the most important things. We live off our grandkids and our children posting things about their, their children that we get to be involved in because we can't always travel to watch this game or to hear this concert or whatever. So we live off of our grandchildren on Facebook. But there's another really neat thing about it, and it's that Facebook sends us old people reminders about things we posted about years ago that we likely wouldn't remember ever doing unless it was Facebook reminding us. And it goes, ah, aha. And I had an aha moment just over a week ago. And I was, you know, in the midst of preparing for this sales pitch. Oh, no, it's a sermon, right? It's a sermon, not a sales pitch. And, um, and Facebook, I was at the cottage, and I open up my phone, and here's Facebook reminding me that it was June 1st, five years ago, that I became the transitional pastor at Grace MB Church. Five years ago. And it took me back to some of those early days leading up to that, and in the days since, when I thought about my hopes and dreams of, of what that might mean. And I had to believe that most of the people at Grace at that time had a lot of thoughts about what could the future hold? What could God have in store for us in the future? Now, one main thought that I had was that it would likely be essential, and I think everybody that was here thought this, it would be essential for the church to become more engaged with the local community than we had in the past, to become more of a community church. When you looked at the directory of grace and where most of the people came from, hardly anybody lived in the neighborhood. They came from New Hamburg, they came from Breslau, they came from North Waterloo, they came from all around the city, but very few people actually lived within walking distance of the church. And so you really felt God had planted this church here in this space. And we need to think about what our neighborhood is. So we had to ask the question, just like, but not to justify ourselves, but we did have to ask the question, who is our neighbor? And it would be really easy on Belmont Street and Belmont Village to look up the road and look at John Street and Union Street and Claremont and rush home and think, wouldn't that be lovely? to have all these rich folks decide to make this their home church. But God had a real different answer for us. Came back and said, no, it's the people living on Pollander, Brybeck, Moorgate, in Victoria Hills. Those were the people God was calling us to. And yes, he also needed to embrace and be embraced by a younger group of believers to be part of the church. And something that developed along the way was 
a relationship with a number of Tigrinian-speaking believers who joined our fellowship to be part of what God was doing here. And so as I reflected uh, on this in, in preparation for today, I am amazed at what God has done over these five years. It is a miracle. This week, Gord shared the letter, and did today again, that we received from CRA that recognizes that Radiant City Church has now officially been named and become Belmont Village Church. And to be honest, we've become Belmont Village Church long before CRA gave us the right to call ourselves that. God has been working and drawing us together into a fellowship of believers. CRA is just a stamp on a name. But it's a significant piece to our journey that has fallen into place that will bring about the official merger of two churches into one body of believers. God has orchestrated the coming together of Radiant City, a church founded with a very young group of believers that had formed around the idea of moving into a neighborhood and focusing on making disciples of Jesus, being Jesus and word and deed to those who don't know him. And Grace MB, a group of more seasoned believers who knew their life of mission was not over. Now, one thing I did when I took on my role was to talk to a number of people, people within grace, and just let's dig deep. I, I wanted to hear from people and ask them about their history of grace. What worked? What didn't work? How did we get to where we are today as a church five years ago? And what they thought needed to be addressed to make it a sustainable ministry. And I also spoke to people who have been connected to grace at times, but were not part of the actual church. And fo one focus was on the previous attempt of grace to partner with another church called the Dwelling Place and try to understand why it had not succeeded. Now, very much like Radiant City, the Dwelling Place was a group of younger believers that met at Victoria Hills for a number of years. And came together with grace for a short season that just didn't work. And so part of that was, well, if you, don't, if you know why it didn't work, maybe we can avoid <laughs> making the same mistakes twice. So one of my earliest conversations with Mary Ellen Tierney. Mary Ellen is our uh, guest today and will be sharing with us shortly, but for the, she's a, a retiring from being a pastor at Waterloo Mennonite Brethren Church this summer, but for the past 15 years has led an ESL ministry at Victoria Hills Community Center called Learn English, Make Friends. And there's been soccer camps and all kinds of other things attached to it over the years, and many of our radiant people have had some participation uh, with some of those things. So she's not unknown to most of us. But uh, Mary Ellen had been part of the dwelling place and has been passionate about embracing the newcomers to our community through this ministry. And that early conversation has stuck with me through this whole merger journey and was foundational for embedding the idea of building a church focused on the needs of the community around us. But it's more important for us to not only consider what people feel and think about what we should be doing as a church. It's ultimately more important, the most important, to understand the heart of God. It's not my ideas, it's not Mary Ellen's ideas, it's not Gord's ideas, it's not anybody's ideas. It's understand the heart of God and what he wants us to be. So this is not going to be a deep dive into the scriptures, but rather a sampling of some Old Testament and New Testament passages that are relevant to what we are presenting to you today as a specific ministry opportunity. So let's pray. Father, as we look to your word, uh, we look also to the history of how you have been working and leading. And Lord, we just see so many ways that you are just drawing pieces together that fit. 
And so we pray, Lord, that uh, you would continue to speak to us and reveal the truth of this. And if it's the right thing for us as a group of believers to embrace and to participate in and to commit ourselves to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I say foreigner, what do you think of? An 80s rock band? No, they were, they were awesome. Was it, or 70s, maybe. 80s? Okay. Lori's my official rock music <laughs> connoisseur, but Foreigner was a great band. But no, what the, how the dictionary describes Foreigner is one not native to a place or community. One not native to a place or community. And there's a lot of rhetoric about immigration issues and immigrants, not only in the US, but also in our country, that is very negative right now and so counter to what God has spoken to us in his word. So I want to share some passages. The first one is from Leviticus 19, verses 33 to 34, where God, in giving the law to the Israelites, said, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Seems to be pretty clear and straightforward language from the Lord, isn't it? Again, in Leviticus 23, 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings, the things that you've missed as you've gone through the first time. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord, your God. And then in Leviticus 24, 22, you are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. You, you got to treat everybody the same. I am the Lord, your God. And then in Leviticus 25, 35, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and stranger so they can continue to live among you. And then finally in Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. That's a neat description of God, isn't it? The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. You can't bribe him. He defends the cause of the fatherless, and the widow, and loves who? The foreigner, residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. There's really a common issue that these people that God's describing have. The fatherless, the widow, the foreigner, all are resource challenged, aren't they? Compared to normal, long-standing community members who have a, a history of residency, a family and friends in the community that can support them. They're resource challenged in many ways. And although the scripture often talks about the need for a place to live and for food and for clothing, I'd like to suggest one of the biggest resources that they need is language. Language, to be able to integrate into a new culture, into a new community. It's a pathway that allows them to communicate their need, but also to get to know how to live in this place. I was involved quite a bit with, uh, through Ray of Hope with Welcome Home, which was a housing program for refugee claimants. And these people just arrived with nothing. They'd left someplace fearing for their lives. 
some war-torn place for the most part, many of them, and they landed here and it was like so often it was sign language try, trying to communicate. Um, and it was, it, to me, it, it certainly impacted my thought and my heart um, for that ministry. So this is very dear and close to it. So this was the law that God was passing down to Israel to live by as a nation and individuals. And I'd like to sum it up this way. Remember who I am. Remember who I am, he told Israel. The Lord, your God. And remember who you were, foreigners in Canada. Oh, wait a second, no. For some of us, this is exactly the truth. They've come from somewhere else. For many of us, there's a, a family history. You know, for my family, I go back into the early 1900s when my grand, maternal grandfather got off a boat in New York uh, and got processed through Nor New York to come to Canada. You know, he was a foreigner. Now he spoke English, which was really helpful, but he was a foreigner. Others can trace your roots back to Germany, to Russia, in, into the Mennonite wave of oppression that took place decades ago and have moved their family, have come here. And it's grandparents or parents that have shared their stories of being new to the country. But we have many people in our community where they're foreigners here in Canada and God wants us to remember it that we were once foreigners as well. Solomon in his wisdom passed on this instruction in Proverbs 3, 27, 28. In Proverbs 3, we usually go to verse 4, 5, 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not under your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And that was the first sermon I preached at Grace when I came and was invited just to be a pulpit supply person and look at where it ended up. Trust in the Lord. But he has this to say further down in the chapter. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. And often we think about the importance of physical needs like housing, food and clothing, material things that people need. But I'd like you to consider how important language and culture are to a newcomer. Not only for immediate needs, but longer term to find a place within a new community. Language is such an important thing. And it doesn't cost us to reach into our pocket or our checkbook or e-transfer to provide something that all of us just take for granted. That we can speak English and are familiar with that, but it is something that is such a great need for a newcomer. Isaiah the prophet recognized that those from a different culture can embrace faith and become part of God's redeemed community. And that's often we, we think of foreigners as you know, having this other religion, this other culture, and you know, they're different. But this is what Isaiah records in chapter 56, verses 6 and 7. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now we joke that Baptists will think they're the only people in heaven, but no, it's not true. All nations that come through Jesus into the presence of the Father. Israel failed miserably in keeping their end of the deal when it came to God's covenant with them. And one of the many things that God helped them, held them accountable for was voiced through the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel 22, 29 says this. Now, like this, 
you read the prophets, they just, you know, they, God lambastes them about so many things. But this is one thing that was important. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy and mistreat the foreigner, denying them justice. They did the exact opposite of what God told them, instead of treating them fairly, and that the law applies to everybody. Everybody is the same. And that was one of the things that God held them accountable for. They failed to love their neighbor. Paul, in writing to the Romans, expresses what our attitude should be as the foundation of our relationship with our neighbors. Romans 15, one to two says, we are who are strong, right? have resources, ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of, each of us should be, be, please our neighbors for their good to build them up. And who is in my neighbor? Uh, in this wonderful encounter that we've, Judy read for us between Jesus and an expert in the law, we see a wonderful principle of what it means to be a neighbor, don't we? The words of Jesus himself echo the words of his father that we looked at earlier. And it's really that it's not Jesus that says the words, it's actually the, the, uh, the, the, the lawyer, right? The, the teacher of the law, when he's responding to Jesus' question, well, about what's written in the law, about how I inherit eternal life, it's, it's the, the, the law teacher, not Jesus, that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those words, which Jesus said you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. They echo the words of the Father as Jesus speaks that, and it's recorded other places where he shares that. And we get this question of, well, who's my neighbor? And we all know the story, it's so familiar. It's, you know, the, the two religious guys that kind of go, ooh, I'm not getting involved here, I'm passing by. But it's the Samaritan, the person who is kind of an, in an, an uh, a relationship with Israel that's just like this, right? He's the one that reaches out in mercy and responds. And Jesus' words to him are just, go and do likewise. Here's a wonderful example. Go and do that. Go and be a neighbor like that. And finally, James, who really focuses on the need of our, for our faith to be lived out in action, has this to say. Echoing the words of God the Father and Jesus. In James chapter 2, verse 8, and then 14 and 17, he says this. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. If you're doing that, that you're living the way God wants you to. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. What we're being presented with as a church today is an opportunity to put our faith into action to reach out to our neighbors who are foreigners, newcomers to our country, our culture, and our language. And so I'm gonna invite Mary Ellen to come up, if you would. Mary Ellen, I've known for a number of years now, um, and I'm only gonna ask you one question. You can't read it. Okay. Okay, so the one question is to get you started because I know from previous conversations that you'll not need any further prodding to share the story of Learn English, Make Friends. Yep. Um, let me be honest though, it is a three-part question. Okay. I, don't, I don't want you to think I'm cheating on you here. Okay. So if you could, for us, describe what Learn English, Makes Friends is. Yep. How did you get involved in this ministry? 
And then how have you seen God work in your life, the lives of volunteers, and especially in the lives of participants? Okay. And if I need to, I'll break in and kind of okay. cut you off I, or direct I, I you. I think I have them all. Okay, I'll leave them here yeah. for you. I just click this button. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll get one. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, so I look out here. Like, so for a, a time, Learn English, Make Friends was part of this church because the dwelling place was part of Grace. And it was Lincoln Road Chapel. Some of you people were there when I was commissioned to this work. And so that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so um, on behalf of WMB Church, we want to thank you. We have given you a gift, which is Learn English, Make Friends. With my retirement and the shift in WMB, we have a church in Waterloo, a church in Kitchener, and we really felt like Learn English, Make Friends needed to land in a neighborhood church. And so we did the ask. Um, and so we thank you for accepting. Um, so how I became involved, which I didn't actually prepare, but I'll do that quickly, was um, one of the elders at the dwelling place was in a preschool class like environment with Paula Bauman. Some of you would know this, uh, know Paula. And she came, she, they told her we, they needed a community pastor. And so I, she told me about it, I applied. And as I drove by, because it's in my neighborhood, Victoria Hills Community Center, the more I drove by and prayed for the right person, I thought, oh, I think it's me. And the rest is history. Um, yeah, so, um, so I want to tell you some of how God, and it's God who has been at work in the past 15 years, although there have been volunteers, <laughs> like Joan Linkert in the children's program, and Brad, and Cheryl, and Utah, and Mark sitting here, right? Uh, there have been people over the years who have been part of this. And so, um, yeah, so I want you to picture, so I'll tell you a little bit about the ministry. So I want you to picture with me on Tuesday mornings, Thursday evenings, the gym at the community center. On Tuesday mornings, there's about 10 tables and about 40 people. And on Thursday nights, there's about, I don't know, depends upon the week, maybe 13 tables and about 50, over 50 people. And they're all sitting at tables and they are engaged in a conversation. There's laughter, there's often deep conversation, but there's always people leaning in to hear what each other are saying. And then on Thursday nights, there's a children's club and a preschool class, and they're a little more rowdy. Hey, Joan? <laughs> so two things about lear Learn English, Make Friends are in the ministry name. People learn English, and they make friends. Because the lessons are conversation-based with a series of questions on a topic like food, healthcare, culture shock, family, People are given the confidence in this environment to go out into their new country and live their life. Even if their English is not perfect, they know they have been in, understood in this environment. So I can go to the lady, you know, at the counter and tell her what I need. So many people have told us what a difference the volunteers have made in encouraging them as they try to reinvent themselves in a new career path or being in the given, given the right words to approach another person on the playground. I think of the woman who was really good at English, but she came with such little confidence. And she learned, she volunteered, and then she said, see ya. I'm confident now, and she's now the, or she has been for a long time in the past, the head of the Neighborhood Association in Victoria Hills and works in the community. It is a community where newcomers have a chance to share their stories, past, present, and dr the dreams for the future, a safe environment where they belong. It is incredible how much a sense of belonging makes you learn a language faster. The way God takes conversations over the year has been amazing. 
a Muslim woman sitting at a table saying, I'm all alone this week. I can finally ask my questions. I know what we think about Jesus. What do you think about Jesus? And for 45 minutes until the next person came, the volunteer was able to say what we think about Jesus. I remember the time John Clausen again was alone at a table and a man walked in with a backpack and sat beside him and opened up the backpack and put down a book and said, I found this book in the middle of the street. What is this? And John said, it's a Bible. He said, well, can you tell me about this book? And John had the whole class to tell him about it because they were one-on-one. -on -one, and at the end, the man said, OK, I'll go home and read this. Never saw the man again. Um, there are the times, the time when a woman, um, again, the one-on-one -on -one opportunities are lovely. Usually it's one volunteer with three students. That's kind of the norm, because that's a, a nice number in ESL. But it was housing that they were talking about. And the woman had a chance to say, I grew up in Somalia. I had a big house in Somalia. Lots of people do. But then violence hit, and I fled to Iraq. And then violence hit there. And I fled to Syria. And then violence hit there. And now I'm in Canada. I'm in Kitchener. I live in a two-bedroom apartment with f six people. And I don't care because I finally am safe. Mm. So you know, there, there are times when people can tell their story. We had these hypothetical <laughs> questions on a games night one night. And one of the questions was, well, what would you do if all of a sudden everybody in the world disappeared and you were the last person. And, you know, it brought tears to my eyes because the woman who answered it said, well, I lived it. They came. They killed everybody in my village. And I was hiding in the woods. So I have lived this question. And to us, it was just, oh, you know, a hypothetical question. And to her, it was real life. And she had a chance to tell that story and then how she came to Canada. Participants have said, wow, I came to learn English, but I learned way more. I learned how to live in this country. I learned other country, other cultures. You know, sometimes we have a how do you cut watermelon. Well, I learned different ways to cut watermelon, how to do my laundry. And so did everybody else. To have a place, safe place to ask questions. You know, like, why do you Canadians do that? Or how to approach a particular situation with a neighbor. Or why are there suicides at the University of Waterloo? I thought all Canadians were happy. Or how do I explain to the doctor my medical problems in words that they'll get that are simple enough for me? And where do I buy yucca? So all kinds of safe places within this to ask those kind of questions. And the volunteers have learned and they grow as much as they help others to do so. It is such an amazing experience. Don, the, during the pandemic, everybody went, a whole whack of volunteers said, when we had to go online, I can't do online. I, I can't do this, this is outside my learning curve box, I can't do it. And within a number of months, they were saying, uh, could I come back? Could you teach me how to do Zoom? And I, I, I saw, they so desperately missed this environment of this community of being with people from other countries. On Thursday night, there's a children's club and a preschool class. And these are spaces where children are helped through play-based learning to adjust to Canada, an English environment, crossing cultures, you know, so the Korean kids don't just hang out with themselves. They cross, you know, all these barriers. And early on, the police told us, if you can catch somebody who is any child, really, not just new to Canada, any child, if you can catch them when you're young and give them a place to belong, it makes my life a lot easier. We had a young man who I remember the volunteers were like, we only have a couple of kids. We should just shut down the children's club. And I said, you go home and pray. And they went home and prayed. And they all came back with the same answer. Oh, look at the kids we have. They need one-on-one. -on -one. 
And so we, we still have a relationship with a young man who could have really gone down the wrong path. But he's working and he's living a very different life than he would have lived. Um, yeah, and separate from Learn English, Make Friends, which is what we do with the city of Kitchener um, at the community center, there's also ESL Bible studies on Thursday mornings. And many stories, we have many stories I could tell you of people learning about Jesus. Some never even had heard about Jesus. This year we studied the book of Mark and a young woman from Korea broke down when we got to the place where Jesus died and how violently he died. She had never heard this before. And she cried and cried. But the joy, imagine the joy to find out that he rose. <laughs> And now she is, you know, continuing to figure out this faith that she is, is coming to terms with. There's a young Muslim, uh, not young, he wasn't young, Muslim man who lived in Palestine. And when we studied with him, the scriptures came alive because he had lived in the places and visited the places and he could tell us all about, all about them. Um, yeah, so... It's so lovely, like it's, it, well, it's not lovely. It's exciting, it's amazing to see lives change. Our lives change because when you study scripture cross-culturally, you learn so much from other people. Um, and yeah, and so again, this is a place of deep conversation and laughter. It's a place where people come into the kingdom. They come to church. They are baptized, they are discipled. Three weeks ago, we baptized a man from Honduras named Mario, you know, and to hear the powerful story of him, you know, realizing that it was God who protected him from the gang violence when he removed him out of situations where people were, you know, murdered, and he was not. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's an amazing ministry. <laughs> I can't believe I'm retiring from it. Uh, it seems weird, but it's God's call. He's asked me to do it. And I think it's because I really believe. Because the more I prayed, even in a dream, it's because your two churches have merged and the time is right for, for Learn English Make Friends to come to this, to come to be part of this congregation. Oh, I could tell you bazillion stories, but I won't because we ha don't have all day. So, it, did I miss anything? No, no. Is, did she miss anything? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, seriously, you are going to love this. So, do you want to talk to Yuta before I pray? No, I'm, I want you just to stand here for a minute. Okay. Because we want to pray for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll take it. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for Mary Ellen and her faithfulness and the faithfulness of so many volunteers over the years mm -hmm. that have listened to your call, mm -hmm. been obedient to loving you and to loving our neighbors. And so we thank you for this passing of a baton. Um, it, it, it seems like a, a godly moment in the life of our church and in Mary Ellen's life uh, and in the life of WMB to know that this is where God is calling us to take up this ministry. And so we thank you, Father, for leading, for guiding, for softening our hearts to love you and to love our neighbors. And so whatever you have in store and what you call Mary Ellen and Paul to next, Lord, uh, we know that they will follow and say yes, Lord, uh, to whatever that might be. And so we thank you and praise you for the impact that you've had through this ministry. Amen. I did forget one piece. So this, this is a, like a fully functioning thing. Like you are getting the most amazing volunteers in the world that you are gonna join with. Yeah, I was gonna just wrap up a few loose ends. Okay. And that was one of them. So okay. there you go. Great minds think alike. Yeah, I tell you. Okay, must be. <laughs> yes. Like, this is not something that, you know, everybody's disappearing and retiring with Mary Ellen, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Actually, Marge, would you mind standing up, Marge? Mar Marge is a volunteer, and she came to check us out today. <laughs> you know, and so she's really excited to look around and see you, 
and know that she'll have people to work with in September when we start up again. Um, we, this year, um, we've run our own speak English, like learn English communication circles on every other Thursday night. And, and mostly for uh, people within our fellowship here that English is a second language and they're still wanting to learn uh, more to improve their English and from other people from the community have joined us. So this is a good mix. The Bible study piece is what we focused on. And I remember in that first conversation sitting in the office back here and asking you, I say, so Mary Ellen, how do you think it would work to have that Bible study piece here in a church close to Victoria Hills as opposed to your home? I don't have to clean. I won't have to clean on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't say that, but her face lit up. Her face lit up. So this has been a kind of a journey of five years, and, and God has perfect timing for everything. And so the invitation will be to you. Um, if this is something that God puts on your heart that you would like to participate in, we'll work at that in pre preparation for the fall. Lois and I have uh, told Gord that we would step up and try to replace Mary Ellen uh, in providing some leadership to this ministry here at BBC. And it'll be hard for us to do that, even though there's two of us and one of you. Um, and we're both taller. But, uh, <laughs> but so, you know, if you got questions, reach out to me and let me know. Um, Yuda and Cheryl, could you just stand? These are the people you can ask questions to as well. Yuda has been 15 years involved in this Over. ministry. Over 15 years. 2009, she told me, was when she was retiring and decided she was gonna, needed something to do, and God drew her into this. And Cheryl's been involved for 10 years. Um, and you mentioned other people that I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Joan had, was with the Children's, Cl Children's Club oh. for a while, and, and Brad, and I'm, I'm missing somebody, I'm sorry. <laughs> so there's other people to talk to, to get the, the first, not the sales pitch from Harry, <laughs> but the, okay, what's it really like? And I'd encourage you to go and talk with them. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mary Ellen, for 15 years of ministry, but also extend our appreciation to the leadership at WMB to go, I think we can trust these folks over here at Belmont Village to pick up the mantle mm -hmm. and, uh, and follow. Yeah, and the students said in the ESL Bible study, because I told them it would be here, because it can't be at the center. Well, it could be what we'd have to pay. <laughs> what? <laughs> but, um, but I told them, you know what, it's okay, because this feels like home. Mm. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. May I pray? Yes, you may pray okay. for us, too. I'd like thank to you. pray for the church. <laughs> Lord, I thank you so much. Isn't this exciting, Lord God? A new church birth, Belmont Village Church this week with the, you know, at least from CRA's perspective. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I know and I trust that Belmont Village Church will do more and greater things than the, than the dwelling place and WMB did in this ministry. Bless it, use it, and may you always be the focus of this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.